Stanford University. Well, we, we spend a lot of time, um, or we're powerfully invested in the idea in our society that um, it is possible to rank people, first of all, and that when you rank people, what you're ranking them on are their uh, individual characteristics, right? That you're ranking them on something that is inherent to them. Um, and that idea is um, very powerful in our society, and it also happens, I think, to be false. Um, that, uh, first of all, you can't really rank people um, in any kind of orderly or fair way. And secondly, when you do rank them, you're not just ranking them on the basis of some individual trait, but you're also picking up on all kinds of advantages and opportunities and arbitrary things and luck and you know, facts about their family or background or upbringing that happened to have influenced how they performed at a certain thing. So it's not a very, it's not a pure measure of their own merit. It's a reflection of a whole basket of things, some of which, many of which, have very little to do with that individual. One of them is that when we look at people who aren't successful, we need to remember that that's not entirely due to some feeling on their part. But also, more importantly, when we look at people who are successful, we have to remember that it's also their success is not is also not purely the result of their own merit. They got lucky, and we should be honest about that. So, where and where does success be? Uh, how did you interpret or define success? Well, you know, I think uh, life is ultimately terribly ironic because uh, I went into infectious disease because to me it was the one specialty in internal medicine that was all about cure. You know, I had the conceit of cure. I looked at cardiologists and I thought, you know, what do they do? Puts around their roto rooters and, you know, <laughs> clean up the drugs and it, it all comes back. And if you're an infectious disease person, you can uh, make a striking diagnosis in someone with fever from the Congo and they rise like Lazarus. And it was so ironic, that it's a, so ironic that a fatal illness should land in the lap of uh, people like me, caught up in that conceit of cure. And in a funny way, that was the most valuable lesson of my life. That was where my success, if you will, came because I learned the distinction between healing and curing. And I know that sounds hokey to you guys, so I have to explain. I have to give an example that I use with my students. I, I say to my students to try and distinguish healing from curing. I say, if you go home from this, uh, this meeting to your dorm and you find that the, the door's being kicked open and all your valuables, God forbid, are are taken and all your belongings are strewn all over the place, but your money's gone, your computer's gone, your iPod, God forbid, has been taken. <laughs> you would be devastated. And if the police come by an hour later and say, we found the person who did this, here's all your stuff back, you will be cured, but you will not be healed. Your sense of violation will be so strong, you might even move from where you are. And I think all illness has those two aspects, mm -hmm. a, a physical sense of uh, something lost, but also a, a great sense of violation. Our parents wanted to be, wanted me to be a doctor. I don't think they realized they were stereotypes as they wanted this. They just really wanted it. They wanted me to be safe in this country. They knew I was bright enough to be a doctor, so why not just turn my energy in that direction? And, you know, ultimately they just couldn't turn me. I was like an ox heading off in another direction. <laughs> and at first I, I kept lying to them, you know, for years and years, telling them I was going to try to be a doctor until I left for college. You know, I wrote my college application saying I wanted to be a dermatologist, and then I got to college and then I told my parents, no, but maybe I'll be a lawyer, I want to be a lawyer. And then I sort of switched away from that in my mind. <laughs> you know, I applied to law school and deferred. And, you know, thought, worked for a couple of years and then decided, oh gosh, I guess I should kind of get the job where you wear pantyhose. And so I thought, you know, some kind of job where you have to go into work. So, so I went to uh, public policy school at the Kennedy School of Government, which was not in my bio. I sort of obliterated it from my bio. Um, and you could do that. <laughs> shot path for many people to finding their true love of what they want to do. You have to figure it out over time. And even though I always knew I wanted to be a writer, it was many years before I had the courage to face my parents and tell them that, guess what, comma, I'm going off to the middle of nowhere in Iowa to study creative writing for two years. And my sister for years told everyone I was in journalism school. You know? <laughs> um, so I, I think, you know, for me, it was a 
challenge to become a writer, and for many, many years, my parents didn't believe in what I was doing at all, and I had to seek my um, approval, you know, from myself and from others, and and uh, and then ultimately they became okay with it when I got a job as a professor. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.